Welcome back, everybody, um, in our Zoom land, as well as people in the room. Um, my name's Tom Feenberg. I'm from the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, and this is um, actually my first time coming to Mianjin, which is, seems very strange that it is my first time. Um, so much like our other visitors who are coming to uh, Mianjin for the first time, I'd like you to say, I'm one of you, so I know that feeling, no matter if you've come from a long way or a short way. Uh, in our final session today, we're going to be focusing again on music health and well-being, which seems to be a common theme throughout this conference. Uh, and we have four presentations, and I'd like to apologise that we weren't able to offer you yet another lot of food in between the sessions, <laughs> because um, I don't know about you, but that lunch and then afternoon tea within an hour was um, very, very generous, Bridey, and the Sim team. So I think that hopefully we've got enough energy to survive this last session. All four pre presenters are online. I don't know if we're able to see their... Oh, we're, we're already getting ready to show. We will see their faces in a minute. Um, so I'll first of all hand over to Kate, who's going to be um, speak, or sharing her presentation on embodying artistic citizenship in addiction recovery musical context. Hi, my name is Kate Daly. I'm an arts practice researcher from the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at the University of Limerick in Ireland. Today, I will be presenting on my paper entitled Embodying Artistic Citizenship in Addiction Recovery Musical Contexts, looking at the different methodological and conceptual frameworks I employ within my arts practice research. Firstly, what do I mean when I say embodying? For me, this is my felt experience of singing and facilitating group singing. As Nagel describes it, the what is it like feeling? I'm examining and interrogating this through my arts practice. I sing in a number of diverse contexts with classical and folk repertoire. And for my PhD research, I'm focusing on the recovery context. I find myself now on an oyristic path which begins with a question or a problem the researcher seeks to illuminate, a personal challenge, the search to understand oneself and the world in which one lives. It is autobiographic, yet with virtually every question that matters personally, there is also a social and perhaps universal significance. I seek creative ways with others to sustain my own recovery, health and well-being journey. Through artistic citizenship, I wish to illuminate this personal challenge, which may have a larger social significance. It is also taking my story to challenge the meta-narrative and stigma surrounding recovery. I begin by reflecting on my values and beliefs which impact my singing body. And I look at how I hold and respond to the stories I tell myself about my recovery, my voice, and the number of roles I hold in my research, that of researcher, facilitator and participant in recovery. I use both reflection in action as the sessions are happening and reflection on action. So writing reflective journals, post sessions about what works, what didn't, what next and why. Delving further into the meaning making I embody or internalize from each encounter. I'm employing reflexivity, not only to improve the way I facilitate, but to examine my experience in an auto ethnographic way so zooming in on my subjective experience and then zooming out to see how this is culturally linked. I also employ narrative inquiry. As Clandon and Connolly describe it, we live story lives temporally in space and time and relationally with others around us. I look at how my body holds stories which have impacted how and why I engage as a singer and facilitator. I look at narrative inquiry in the form of storying, as this is a way I can connect my experience, evaluate and share it with my community that is inside and outside the academic space. I apply the storing principles by Philips and Bunda. So storing which nourishes thought, body and soul, which claims voice in the silenced margins, which is embodied relational meaning making, which intersects the past and present as we are living oracle archives and which enacts collective ownership and authorship. I'll now look at some of the conceptual frameworks I'm using in my research. So I begin with 
a definition of addiction, which is seen as the recurrent use of alcohol or other drugs, compulsive behaviours, which cause significant clinical and functional impairment. Recovery then is the time when a person is not active in their addiction. And there are many ways into recovery. It is not a linear process from ailment to cured, but a maintenance continuum. A person can engage in abstinence oriented norms, for instance, but recovery usually sees a person repairing their lives, developing coping mechanisms away from their compulsive behavior or substance use disorder. Recovery capital is a conceptual framework in addiction recovery. It has four categories of resources to support an individual's sustained recovery. There are social, physical, human, and cultural. My intention with my facilitation practice is to offer cultural capital through peer support in music making spaces. The conceptual framework of artistic citizenship represented simply is the act of showing up for one's community. I employ this framework in my research as I've seen how my arts practice as a singer and group singing facilitator has brought me to better serve my community's needs and my own. In many respects, it is the antithesis of the current individualistic trend highlighted by Silverman and Elliot in our society. And they encourage artists to actively engage in responding to community needs. In my own community of people in recovery, I saw the public spaces to create music together were either in educational or religious settings, but the main social cultural space was the public house. I saw personal and community need to create spaces which would be safe music making spaces for people to engage in recovery. By singing here, I'm enacting my artistic citizenship. I also challenge my own beliefs and values of what it means to be an artist. Silverman and Elliot highlight how there is an 18th century residual notion of what good art is. I challenge this in myself as someone with a traditional formal vocal pedagogy. Interrogating my feeling of anxiety in performance, I question why I'm performing. I need to know what the purpose is in my singing. Singing my felt experience of recovery in a space with others who understand my internalized stigma meant I was, and we were, showing up for one another, recognizing our communal need to perform recovery, where it could become recovery capital. Addiction recovery musical contexts, both the real and conceptual, are spaces I carry out my research. They are musicking spaces, a term posited by Christopher Small, a place to sing solo group songs, recite poetry, play instruments, or enjoy listening in the group. The important aspect of these contexts is the bookending and grounding, check in and check out at the start and end of each session. Being in the room is enough. This is showing up for one another. I engage as a singer in these spaces and facilitate songs which others may like to partake in, but it is first and foremost this peer space. I also see how these spaces are a way to challenge health stigma around addiction recovery. Ideally, I would like to see them flourish in our communities, but for now, to create a safe space, we invite only people who are affected by addiction directly, including family members. There are also spaces which can have therapeutic outcomes, but the relationships and the goals we establish are that of a community music creative encounter. In my research, when I examine my values, I look at key moments or as Clandonan and Connolly term them, memory artifacts, or as Phillips and Bunda describe them, they are fragments of my story. I recognise that a key influence in my life course was my classical music education and the traditional measurement of excellence and aestheticism attached to that. But I would like to finish my presentation with the story of another formative influence, that of the people in my life. So I went to study singing performance in Dublin at the conservatory, so continuing my classical vocal education, but I left after one month. I felt it was too competitive and I was highly anxious there. 
When I arrived home, my grandmother pictured here, a frail yet mighty woman rose from her chair in the corner of the living room and she greeted me with only the best fail. It was not what I wanted to hear and I rolled my eyes and said a very unthankful thanks. It took me a couple of decades to understand her wisdom in what she had shared with me and it, it has stuck with me. Firstly, for how ironic it sounded but now as I examine how I find myself on this path of meaning making in my singing recovery life. Her words ring truer than ever for me. My supervisor posed a question in a conversation on a different topic recently about how do we fail successfully? And this immediately led me to think of my grandmother's words that have been with me all these years. So I add to her phrase that only the best fail successfully. And this refers back to my heuristic path as I'm learning to fail well and to prove with each iteration of my work. And that is to meet my own and potentially my community's needs with artistic purpose. Here are my references and thank you so much for listening today. So I've been informed that we have 19 people online, so it's great to see that interaction in that space. Um, up next, we have Lena, who's going to be um, sharing her presentation from Individual to Collective Wellbeing, the roles of volunteering for popular music. Hi, my name is Lena Lozano. I work as a research officer for the European Network Life DMA. And today we would like to share with you our latest thoughts about volunteering for popular music and about its connections to individual and collective well-being. But before we jump onto the topic, uh, just a few words about Live DMA, so you get a better view of where I am speaking from. Live DMA was created in 2012. We are a nonprofit association based in Nantes in France. And we do represent 20 national associations scattered over 16 European countries, totalizing around 3,000 live music venues, clubs, and festivals. Our missions range from observation to cooperation through advocacy. Uh, we maintain a regular survey and an open resource platform that you can access through our website. We aim to build strong alliances within the musical sector, exchanging good practices in terms of life management, supporting dialogue between our members and their local policy makers, while we work towards the recognition of popular music venues, clubs and festivals as key cultural, economic and social operators. Based on our missions, we get a precise look over the daily life of grassroots music venues and festivals. And when we heard about this conference, we thought that it would be interesting to approach the notion of music and well-being, not through the lens of music making, not through the lens of music listening either, but through the lens of working in music and on top of that, of working in music for free. So who are the volunteers? When dealing with the notion of volunteering in Europe, we obviously come across a methodological challenge since national histories of the nonprofit sector has differently influenced the countries we represent, as you can see on the works from Andrew Ras here displayed or from the work of Archambault also displayed on the slide. However, we managed to find some common grounds regarding the missions undertaken by the volunteers but also regarding the reasons why they would undertake such missions. So why do people volunteer? Research tends to show that volunteering might serve as a source of well-being. All sectors combined, literature tends to display the following reasons for getting involved as a volunteer. Stand them for a cause, to share skills and experiences, to bond, to get a break from their life, to feel integrated, useful, or to be acknowledged. Within the music sector, we 
might note some extra reasons to justify a volunteer commitment to get to know an ecosystem from within, to get professional skills, to get a free access to music or culture, to discover new artists, new bands, or to have professional networking opportunities. Those extra reasons then match the findings from a recent study upon rock music festival volunteers, mentioning that volunteers stand in an airlock between production on one side and consumption on the other side. They produce value through the tasks they accomplish and the responsibilities they take upon them, but they are also looking for a spectatorship experience that they trade with workforce instead of with money. So volunteering for the music sector, venues and festivals all together seems to be characterized by a notion of in-betweenness, somewhere between co-creation of value and consuming experience, somewhere between work and pleasure, but also somewhere between work and social life. This list of assets and motivations behind the notion of volunteering then seems to demonstrate how volunteering for music may match the five ways to well-being developed by the New Academic Foundation. To connect, to be active, to take notice, to keep learning and to give. Then, volunteering for popular music might contribute in some way to both individual and collective well-being. And we can indeed clearly match this list, this pathway to well-being with the reasons to justify volunteer commitments listed on the previous slide. But in an article published last year, Corinne opposes this framework with the fact that the focus in those five ways to well-being is actually set on the individual. It is up to the volunteer to take steps to improve its own well-being, but we should also earn the line the responsibilities of the organizations hosting volunteers, requiring volunteer work in to underline their role in creating the conditions for such well-being. Numerous works are already denunciating the excessive use of volunteer workforce, but in addition to that, the Reldo, Islam and Mengia have demonstrated in 2018 that the sense of community, the sense of belonging that we noted earlier as a benefit from volunteering might be weaponized by the organizations hosting volunteer workers, hence creating meaningfulness and exploitation at the same time. Through a case study of music festival volunteering, they show how tedious and exploitative work may actually be experienced as meaningful, enlightening, or socially valuable, masking the workforce economic instrumentality. Consciously or not, then, some music venues and festivals might be using the sense of community and meaningfulness thought by many individuals to, as Toraldo phrases it, infuse meaning into work. However, the volunteers are not naive and they can perfectly word their disappointments upon their volunteering experiences. The Britain network Le Collectif de Festival published a fascinating work upon the ups and downs of music volunteering that actually strongly echoes the very last book of Dan Ferron Beckman, which explores the normalization, the banalization, the trivialization of volunteering, possibly leading to a sense of demotivation, weariness, or even burnout. In early 2023, LiveDMA published a report upon the post-COVID-19 challenges of the live music sector in Europe, in addition to a previous survey upon the impact of COVID-19 on music venues and clubs, both them being downloaded from our website. Among these works, we noted much less participation in music venues and clubs for ten thousands of volunteers many of them having left the organizations to never come back. In the same time, hired workers also massively left the sector. And this shared tendency between hired and volunteer workers from the music sector seems to raise heavy concerns. What if, in order to cope with the lack of financial and human resources, the music sector had directed too much pressure and responsibilities upon volunteers to the point that it's not fun anymore, to the point that it's too formalized to be satisfying and hence 
to the point that volunteering for music is not a source of well-being anymore. If the music sector is not the only one being struck by a volunteer crisis, the repercussions are especially strong and they might jeopardize the world life music ecosystem as Emine Guibert and Parent showed in 2021. Indeed, according to our survey from 2020, 7.8% of venues part of the live DMA network are exclusively run by volunteers, either by choice or because they don't have the financial capacity to hire anyone. In our network, 41% of the workers are volunteers and they do represent up to 16% of the total FTE for our wall network, knowing that those figures might actually evolve quite a bit if we do look at the legal status of the venues. Public venues don't require volunteer work that much, but the private nonprofit ones do rely quite a lot upon volunteer work. Volunteers represent 52% of the total workforce for them and up to 27% of the total FTE. Volunteers being the solid base of grassroots venues, but also festivals, when they left the sector after COVID, they also left the venues and festivals they used to work for pretty shattered. In Sweden, Norway or Finland, during this summer, many festivals had to be cancelled because of the lack of volunteers that would usually help those festivals to actually happen smoothly. So as a conclusion, if you want to support live music, whether you enjoy it in clubs, venues or festivals, remember to care for and to thank the volunteers. You can find inspiration among the numerous recent publications that are calling for a better acknowledgement of how precious volunteer work is, but also from Live DMA, some of our members having their own lists of recommendations to preserve the connection between music volunteering and well-being, such as the Swiss network Petsy, which has developed a volunteer certification in order to valorize the skills acquired by the volunteers. Thank you for your attention. Seems like a good time to thank the volunteers that make conferences happen. In particular, um, I'd like to thank, thank our online facilitators from today. So just going back through the day, we had um, Emma Heard, uh, Brigida online, um, Flora, uh, Tanya, and currently we have Maddie online here, and then also Matt working over here. I, some people are getting paid, some people are not getting paid, but let's just assume that everyone deserves some thanks at some point in time. Um, our third presentation now is from Raphael and, and Lida, and it is on music making in residential care facilities, and I'm probably reading what's already on the screen. Lessons learned from a Greek community music program with older adults. And before we hear that, I'd just like to again encourage people online to ask a question in the chat. Um, we will have a shorter discussion time frame at the end of this session because of the four papers. So it'd be great, at least if we can have some online discussion in advance. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Rafaela Trulu and I'm a PhD student investigating the impact of community music making on the cognitive, emotional and musical development of older people with and without dementia as part of my PhD research. In this presentation, I will provide information about the design of the community music program conducted with older participants in two residential care facilities in Greece. I will also discuss how the design and implementation of the program are associated with positive outcomes related to the well-being agenda, based on some preliminary qualitative research findings. Good practices, challenges and limitations will also be highlighted. 
Relocation and residence in nursing homes often impact negatively the well-being and quality of life of older people, usually affecting their sense of motivation and purpose in life, as well as their general mood and sense of belonging. There is ample research evidence that active participation in community music activities may contribute to improved well-being in later life by promoting the development of feelings of happiness, autonomy, self-confidence and motivation, reducing feelings of isolation and loneliness, and strengthening cognitive function and social engagement. Although a significant amount of studies and interventions are related to the effect of music making on the well-being of community-dwelling older people, less attention has been paid to institutionalized ones. This presentation aims to contribute to a limited knowledge concerning community music making with institutionalized older people, not only in research but also in practice. The intervention period for the community music program took place from July 2022 to May 2023 once a week for 30 to 45 minutes and involved a total of 40 music sessions. 35 older people participated in the program, including 12 with dementia, 14 with some time of cognitive impairment, and 9 with intact cognitive abilities. The community music activities included singing, rhythmic playing on small percussion instruments to accompany songs and movement. Older people were invited to participate in the music activities in any way they felt most comfortable and their participation could range from simple observation to full participation depending on the desire and mood. The music sessions followed a similar structure. The collection of songs used in each session remained mainly stable and involved famous, great well-known to this age group songs. Music making on the spot as well as improvisation were also encouraged. All sessions were videotaped with a 360-degree camera. Semi-structured interviews were conducted before and after the 10-month intervention period with two members of the care staff, which were two psychologists who were also present at each session. I was the facilitator of the community music sessions and I also had the role of the researcher in the process of collecting, analyzing and synthesizing data. Preliminary qualitative research data obtained through thematic analysis of interviews and observation of video recordings suggest that the community music intervention contributed positively to the overall well-being of the participants while also fostering their musical and emotional responses. In particular, first, the intervention served as a means of non-verbal interaction and socialization between participants with different cognitive states and verbal abilities. As the music session progressed, participants began to interact more and more from music making, although their verbal interaction was difficult due to their different cognitive state. It also appears that the intervention contributed to the attunement in some relationships in the context of the care home community. As also noted in the semi-structured interviews, the program helped participants who seemed to be socially excluded from the care home community to find a place where their voices were heard. It that seems that provided them a sense of belonging. Here are some examples from the interviews with the care staff which support this finding. I have seen them motivate each other to play percussion instruments or sing. The sessions provide them with the opportunity to socialize. They may not be friends, but they can now interact with each other in peace. Those who had no social interactions benefited the most. They knew they were coming to a place where their participation mattered. And I know that they had never had that feeling since their relocation here. These people felt important through their participation in the music group. They felt that they belonged somewhere. Secondly, the community music sessions appeared to contribute to better mood and promote general positive emotions. It was also found that participation in the program fostered a sense of motivation in them. Furthermore, as highlighted in the semi-structured interviews, the negative behaviors that some participants with dementia exhibited in their daily lives did not occur during the session. This suggests that the music sessions helped to alleviate some negative symptoms associated with dementia. All these are evident in the following extracts from the interviews with the care staff. There is a world of difference between how he was at the first session and how he became at the end of the intervention period. He was very introverted. He just attended the session and listened. He didn't show any emotional reactions. But after a number of sessions, he was smiling. He seemed happy. He even started playing instruments and singing. He actively participated in the activities with joy. When they hear that you are here and it's time for the music session, they immediately leave their bed where they might lie all day. In this one, the interviewee is talking about a person with dementia. 
He is one of our most difficult residents. He wanders around all the time. His gaze is always lost. He is even aggressive towards other residents. But he was not like that during the music sessions. He even coordinated with others during the musical activities and kept the beat of the songs. When you have that outlook for someone and then you see him doing all these things during the sessions, that's impressive. There is also evidence that the use of a stable structure and repertoire facilitated the gradual familiarity of all participants with the music process while also serving as a means for accessible group singing. Observational data from the video recording suggests that participants, even those with dementia in severe stages, were able to recall and imitate melodies as well as rhythmic patterns and rhythms. These are some examples that support this finding. I am referring here to third person, although I was the facilitator of the music process, but as stated, I also have the role of the researcher and among others, I did the observation of video recordings, so this is why I refer to myself uh, to third person. The facilitator sings the first song and accompanies it with the ukulele. As soon as it ends, she doesn't continue singing the next one, but continues playing the basic chord of the two songs. Then the participant, which is a person with dementia, starts singing the next song by herself and everyone else follows. They have just finished singing a song. Then the music process is interrupted. The facilitator turns it back to the participant because on the other side of the room, a person from the nursing staff wants to talk to her. As long as they are talking, participants continue all by themselves with the music process, rhythmically playing the beat and rhythmic patterns of the next song. In conclusion, and in line with previous research evidence, which highlights the significant positive impact of active and participatory group music making on the mood, behavior, relationships, and overall well-being of institutionalized older people, preliminary qualitative findings from the present study indicate that the implementation of the community music program offered several positive individual level outcomes for participants, such as motivating them, bringing joy to them, providing them a sense of belonging, and helping them to manage some negative behaviors. The care home community also benefited as a relationship between participants in the program seemed to improve to some extent. More research is needed to examine in depth whether these positive effects, which were addressed in preliminary findings 1 and 2, are related to the same structure of the session and the use of a stable repertoire, which was the emergent theme of the preliminary finding 3. At this point, it is important to address some good practices as well as challenges encountered in the implementation of the program that may have contributed to the preliminary results presented. First, a significant amount of session needs to be offered. My experience in this context taught me that the absence of participants was quite a common phenomenon, whether due to their hospitalization or other daily activities or circumstances that occurred at the same time with the sessions. My suggestion is that we offer the double sessions from the milestone we set where planning our interventions if we want to secure our interventions and the validity of our status. Second, Although the striking majority of participants seemed to benefit from the fact that the sessions followed a similar structure and maintained a stable repertoire, as their musical and emotional responses were encouraged, I acknowledge that this may not be the fact for every older adult. Further research is needed to examine in more detail whether and to what extent the use of a stable structure and repertoire may be key features when designing music interventions for older people in residential care. An interesting question is also what is the degree of familiarization after which boredom or indifference may occur, signaling the need for change in structure and repertoire. Finally, the characteristics of participants in the program were very diverse. The coexistence of participants with differing cognitive and mental characteristics may be a double-edged word. On the one hand, such diverse sessions may contribute to the reinforcement of personal relationship between residents, but, on the other hand, it is important that the, that the facilitator always keeps in mind that these people may not have the same needs. Thus, an extensive conversation on heterogeneous or homogeneous groups in interventions may be of significance. Designing studies to investigate such questions is essential, as this is a very usual situation in elderly, in elderly care facilities, not only in Greece, but in other countries as well.
The aforementioned good practices and challenges are based on my personal experience of conducting as practitioner and researcher this specific community music program. And of course, there is need to further analyze qualitative data as well as cross-check and compare these preliminary qualitative findings with quantitative ones before final conclusions are made. Thank you very much. We've had some good questions coming through online, which I'm looking forward to getting to after um, this final presentation. I'd also like to acknowledge that Lucas is still online in whatever form of insomnia he's Thanks currently you. present Thank in. So congratulations to Lucas for that. That's a source of inspiration for us all. For the Australian people in the audience, I would like to say it's nice to give something back to our European friends for <laughs> online conferencing. Um, from the East perspective of many, many midnight sessions over the past three or four years. Um, our final presentation um, comes from South Africa today. It was great to be having a cross-continental representation throughout today's sessions. And it comes from Innocent. And um, her, the, her presentation is, um, this is going to test my Zimbabwean um, language skills, Kumba Noweke Kuno One. Zimbabwean immigrants' experiences of music and placemaking in Johannesburg. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for taking your time to be a part of this uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Tinasia Mutero. Um, from, I'm based in South Africa, but I'm originally from Zimbabwe. So I will be presenting on a study that is, uh, was part of my PhD research. And um, <clears throat> the title of my presentation is Kumbanga Kuyekuno, Zimbabwean Experiences of Music and Placemaking in Johannes State. So uh, if you allow me, let me uh, switch off the video as I do at the presentation. So, Kumbanga Kuyekuno Zimbabwean experiences of music in, in South Africa. It, this study is set in a context of challenges that are um, experienced by immigrants, African immigrants in South Africa. You might have read about Afrophobia in South Africa. Um, so in this, at the time that I did this study, there was a, a, a group what we called itself Operation Tudula, um, essentially a vigilante group which, you, which was fueling xenophobia online. And they've since transformed into um, a, a political party, but not just online. They also had some activities that they did in, in communities, especially um, uh, under under underprivileged communities where most immigrants uh, stay. And we have realized over the years that xenophobia is comes in intervals, and it's almost an election issue. So we know that if South Africa is having a general election, there's going to be xenophobic attacks. At times, this can be violent uh, to an extent of uh, killing people. Uh, and so people sort of know that this is going to happen. But even in this context, Zimbabweans, some of the Zimbabweans say, Kumbanga Kuyekuno, which literally, which literally translates to home should come here. Why should home come here? Um, we have realized that I've used Shona here and I thought it would be important uh, as an ethnomystologist to find ways to understand this uh, in a more nuanced way through understanding the culture of Zimbabwean immigrants, how they've lived. But also, this is also part of my experience because I've been in South Africa for, for 10 years um, and I've seen that besides the xenophobia that happens online, there's far much more that we need to avoid of telling. Um, a single narrative about Zimbabwe in South, Af in South Africa, but also about South Africans in relationship to other nationals that live in South Africa. Even research has sort of found in, in, in an unfortunate way the way most studies actually just speak about um, either the economy or the, these xenophobic experiences when they do happen. Uh, not so much has been written about the cultures of immigrants who live in South Africa. But of course, there are studies um, that have really spoken about cultural identity. Um, 
and and uh, more often than not, they speak of the losses that happen when people move to South Africa. Um, so in with my study, I thought let's not just look at the losses, uh, but let's just look at culture as it is experienced in situ in South Africa. So the purpose of this paper I have already intimated is to explore how music and activities of Zimbabwean immigrants based in Johannesburg contribute to place making. Um, and it's quite clear that you know immigrants are, are not are not passive imbibers of culture. They participate in the making, consumption, and distribution of culture uh, in the city. And what does it do to the city of Johannesburg? In the context of xenophobia that we read about online, but also which is at times experienced in communities. Um, why musicking? Musicking essentially is what the making and consumption of music is for most Africans. We we don't have, of course, with professional musicians, but making of music is a is a community practice where. You know, every activity that happens in the context of, of the making of the music is creates the whole thing that now becomes the experience of uh, of music in our communities. And for 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 small, he says music is taking part in any capacity in a music performance, for instance, by listening, rehearsing, composing, facilitating performance, or accompanying the social life. Important is accompanying the social life. So musicing does away with the pres prescriptions of that, you know, in others, in, in, in the West, there are prescriptions of how music should be made. The score itself is a prescription of how, of how the music should be performed. So with musicing, everything that is that surrounds the making and the performance of the music matters. And in most African communities, music is not, is not uh, transcribed. We, we leave the music, we let it speak to our experience at the time. So that's why it was important to use music in as an entry point to understanding how Zimbabwe has contributed to the placemaking uh, in Johannesburg. So to do my study, I to I I I I, I, I started um, I designed it as a focused ethnography where I interacted with uh, musicians from of Zimbabwe origin and also music consumers of Zimbabwe origin in their natural context. And I had to you know, focus on uh, uh, the box area of South Africa, of the one speak. Uh, and this, I had to purposely select participants. We had been in South Africa for at least five years and who were in music and whom I knew um, as musicians. Um, so, and of course, as the study panned out, I, I also used um, snowballing. I was introduced to, uh, to other uh, musicians. Uh, because it was in ethnography, most of the data collection was really through conversations, community scoping. And I, I had the privilege of being accompanied by a childhood friend, poet, a poet, his name is Poet Chasekremo, around uh, the, the music venues, particularly the venue that I then went to, which is called Kwachikwana. It's important to remember Kwachikwana. Um, Kwachikwana is a Shona name. Uh, it's not It's not a South African uh, name. So one of the key themes that comes out in the study is that in this context of uh, xenophobia that we read about every day, that we see on the news every day, Zimbabweans have created Zimbabwean spaces in Johannesburg, including Kwachikwana, which um, is a, 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 a place named after uh, another place, which is in, in Chitungu, is in, in Zimbabwe. So, what the these these activities where you know Zimbabwean cultures are, are, are practiced in South Africa, they call it Harare Mjoon. So, what Harare Mjoon used to translate it means. Harare in Johannesburg. At Kwachikwana, you find Zimbabwean brands of alcohol. You find uh, Zimbabwean religious products. You find um, Zimbabwean music. So the music, this music plays in, in, in bars, but also is as the people are 
drinking alcohol at the, at the in the parking lot, they would be playing some music in the car in their cars, unafraid of the of the police, unafraid of the authorities. You, you can easily see now that this is this is a community of people who are at home. This is a community which is by far a contrast to what we read uh, of, of, of people who are unwanted. So, but what does the music then do there? What, what is, it essentially does is that it creates everyday citizenship. So Zimbabweans, through their music, you can realize that, and through their music and the making of the music, you can realize that they've not waited for official uh, or, or, or legal uh, legal statuses of, of, of citizenship. They, they live in South Africa, like every citizen does, not mindful of all the noise that goes around. The, the cultural activities that happen when they're making the music, the cultural activities that happen when they're sharing the music, shows you that they, they have transported not just their physical self, but their culture from Zimbabwe into South Africa. And they relate amongst themselves, but also with, with the um, other nationals who are in the community in the same way. So that's why I also speak about how quite if the venue is becoming a space for building both bonding social capital and bridging social capital. So it's not just the consumption of music that happens there. It's not just the making of music that happens there, but relationships are created. Relationships between the Zimbabweans, relationships between um, among Zimbabweans, but also Zimbabweans and South Africans and other nationalities. Relationships which at times are transformational and at times are transactional. Uh, businesses, uh, 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 business deals are done, but beyond that, because people have moved from their home areas, they then create new relationships of kinship, uh, which is which as good as kinship. You know, in this Shona culture, your brother is, becomes your bamku or your koma. Um, such relationships are, are recreated at times on totemically, on to, on to, uh, using potent, but also at times just through meeting the you will become the next person's brother, the next person's sister, uh, and creating a um, sense of family outside, outside home. And so when all this happens, you see, it's not, again, it's not just between Zimbabweans. It's very common to hear Nigerians, South Africans call Zimbabwean my brother or my sister at these musical shows, at these centers such as such as Squatchikwan. But the spotlight is more often than not not given in, 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 in these spaces. The spotlight is more often than not not given to the role the cultural productions such as music, how they work at times better than policies to create uh, peaceful uh, places or peaceful and harmonious relations in communities. Um, I'm going to play this video. So the 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 man in the video there speaks about what Operation to July has been doing. And he says, I can't leave South Africa. I can't leave. I'm a piano music, a very popular genre in South Africa. I can't go with it for Zimbabwe. I'm here for the, for the vibe that is, that is in South Africa. That alone speaks about the role that music plays in making Zimbabwe feel at home. And now, I'm a piano is not even a Zimbabwe genre, but it's South African music consumed in South Africa. It is creating a homely space for Zimbabweans. Um, and, uh, like I've said earlier, in my view, it plays a much more, but not substitute role to, to policy that you know people can live harmoniously. So what we've seen from these studies is that Zimbabweans have managed to manipulate music to find way, new ways of being, 
and connecting in the diaspora amongst the resources, but also with the local community. And music in this corner produces a heightened sense of belonging and contributes towards giving an identity and character to place. Like I've said, Kwachikwana, you find everything in Zimbabwe at Kwachikwana. It's, it's like you're in Chitungu, it's like you're in Harare. And that creates an identity amongst the Zimbabweans, but also gives a new character to the South African place. And the musical reception frequently becomes a site where social relations are negotiated and worked through. Um, I should hasten to say that while the fight against Zimbabwe is legitimate, it is important to acknowledge spaces that are inclusive. It is important for our, our workers, academics, as activists to acknowledge spaces as, as Kwachikwana so that we validate them and we have more um, good new spaces in the which can be replicated to create a more peaceful and more um, loving environment. Um, lastly, music affords the Zimbabwean communities a sense of place, a sense to create, trade, and consume their cultural products in a home of, away from home. I thank you. I will stop the slides and uh, stop sharing. I hope that uh, we can engage more about my study during the question and answer. Uh, once again, I want to thank you for attending the session and also to uh, thank Prof. Lucas and to Prof. Riley for creating this opportunity for me. Thank you. Thank you, Tanache. I'm not sure if Tanache is with us online. Um, we'll, I'll get a bit of a heads up if not. Um, but there was a question that maybe we might start on from Joe. I don't know if Joe is able to, to talk through her question. Um, it'd be great to see as many faces on screen as possible, particularly as we end the day. Um, so camera on would mean you would come on screen. And um, I'm really sorry, I'm getting my daughter ready for school, so I'm engaging through my phone, but I've been listening. Um, it was just to pick up on Kate's discussion about recovery capital, but also, if I understand correctly, Kate might be a person that's in recovery themselves, and the ways in which there might be an element of care or vulnerability for themselves as they're researching that experience. So it was like, a question about the recovery capital, which I've not heard before, and also their own experiences. That's it. Kate, um, a response to that, please. Hi, good morning. And apologies, because I thought I was on time for seven o'clock. I clearly wasn't. <laughs> Oh, I'm phoning in from Ireland. Um, thank you, Joe. It's a great question. And it's been very important uh, with my supervisors to address that from the proposal stage. Um, I am a person in recovery, so it is uh, an infrastructure around that. So we made sure on a personal level that I have support and also in the academic space, my supervisors being there for support. So it's hugely important, actually, that 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 was addressed from the early stages and in terms of then recovery capital so yeah i'm looking at all four sets myself and i i feel very i would say privileged that i'm coming into recovery with a very strong recovery capital in terms of my support network around family and friends in the academic space and also then culturally because i was part, let's say, of a choir group before setting up the new recovery groups. So um, I'm very conscious that there are people who come into recovery who don't have, let's say, the, the basic recovery capital of um, meeting their human needs, kind of those standard needs. Some people come into it homeless, no family supports, no friend supports, you know, broken down relationships. And one of the things that I was looking at in terms of the groups was that <clears throat> around the groups being able to provide a sense of support, even though not all the four frameworks of recovery capital would be available to everyone that would come to them. So it's kind of that additional peer support to help sustain and their recovery, which is, I ha it, thank you for your question. I hope I have answered it in some way. 
No, that's great. Thank you so much. And um, for another time, if we were in person, uh, just how that might relate to other forms of capital. Um, but maybe I'll catch you on email. Thank you. That's great. Okay, I might try and see if there are there any questions in the room. Yes, Gillian. Um, my question is for, oh, sorry, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find my notes and remember that your name, but the woman from the University of Macedonia, <laughs> um, Lena, am I right remembering Lena? Anyway, my question, I was interested in, I wondered if there were people who lived in that residential, in the residential homes who were not part of the music activities and if your data if you, the data that you gathered was able to give you an, a, an idea of what the social impact or the impact of the music making might have been for non-participants in terms of their experience in the home. Yeah, hi, it's me. My name is Rafaela from University of Macedonia. Um, so, uh, in, this is a small part for my study, which focused on the preliminary qualitative findings. However, I also had a control group uh, in my study and some quantitative data as well as, you know, a big study, uh, yeah, the umbrella, the big umbrella in which stands uh, this uh, presentation uh, if, um, in this uh, symposium. Uh, so, um, I cannot stand for this uh, and um, by presenting uh, that I have strong research data to say that there was difference or impact uh, um, during the relationships, uh, about the relationships in the care home community for the non-participants and that there was a difference uh, indicated, um, but uh, because I was the facilitator and I was a researcher, so I have the living experience of being in the setting of the care home and the living experience of uh, um, talking with members of the care staff who um, transferred to me the experiences they had uh, from the non-members -mem of the community music program I engaged. So, yes. There was a difference. Uh, there was a difference in the relationship. There was difference um, on their psychological state, uh, even on the cognitive. But uh, um, for that time being, because it is a preliminary stage where I'm still analyzing all those data, and there is a huge tone of data uh, I have uh, to confront. Uh, so. Um, Maybe um, in some couple of months where I, I, I will be able to share uh, my final findings. Uh, but uh, the first indications I have, uh, impressions I have from the data I have already analyzed, yes, uh, there, was, um, there was difference uh, in the behaviors expressed uh, from the people participating in the community music program and uh, for the people who were not uh, participating. And uh, these differences were indicated especially in uh, the relationships, the relationships among residents, their psychological states, and sometimes some differences and in their cognitive stage. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Gillian was really enjoying the conversation that she wanted to ask another question, but at 5.05, .05, I thought that it would be important to um, ask Lena a question on volunteering, um, joining us from so far across the world. Um, my question for you was um, some thoughts on who can access and who cannot access volunteering. We've um, particularly thinking about financial needs and something that I know that I'm thinking quite a lot about in the programs that we try and offer to enrich programs. Um, with the difficulty of, I guess, leaving employment to go and gain these well-being benefits um, in festivals or, um, I guess, on-country learning experiences in this um, space. Hi. Um, 
So I, I'm speaking from the European level, and it's very difficult to get a unified voice, even as far as the different countries do align or not about what is a volunteer and what does a volunteer. Um, just last week, we were in Berlin with the Live DMA team and, and the 16 countries we do represent, and we had a pretty robust debate uh, about this uh, particular question. Uh, because it seems that the volunteer crisis that we're um, encountering right now since the end of COVID um, has like direct consequences, especially in the Nordic countries. So Sweden, Norway, Finland. Um, we heard that in Norway, there had been many, many festival cancellations over the summer um, because people would not come back to volunteer as they used to the years before. So they had a choice uh, offered to them by the Norwegian government, which was either to cancel the festival or to pay for the volunteers. And they might, uh, they have been able for some festivals to unlock some subsidies to, to provide the volunteers with some sort of compensation, uh, a bigger compensation, more wage related than just like food or drinks or maybe a t-shirt from the festival, stuff like that. So we are thinking that maybe if that crisis is um, retaining somehow, uh, we might be able to reflect at the EU level on the care for the volunteers that I've mentioned as the last slide, but also for more developed compensations, when especially when volunteers are undertaking um, um, like positions of decision, uh, whether they are like participating into the artistic direction or the programming direction, for example. Um, so this is definitely something we might be reflecting upon at the at least trying to reflect upon at the EU scale. Great response. I'd like to thank our presenters in this final session today uh, for joining us online to answer the questions as well as the time put into the presentations.